Hello everybody and welcome to our public lecture. I'm Professor Claire Johnson and I'm the Director of the Australian Catholic University Centre for Liturgy. It is my pleasure to welcome you here today. As we gather, we recognise Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spiritual and cultural connection to country and pay respects to the First Peoples, the custodians of the land from which we join this meeting across Australia. We thank them for their continued custodianship. We respectfully acknowledge all of our elders past and present and thank them for their wisdom and guidance as we walk in their footsteps. With us today, we have attendees from right across Australia, as well as a few from the United States and from New Zealand. We welcome clergy and lay people, married people and single people. It is wonderful to have representatives here from the Archdiocese of Sydney, Life, Marriage and Family Team, Catholic Care Sydney, Marriage Matters, Marriage Encounter in the Bunbury Diocese in Western Australia, Natural, Family, uh, Natural Fertility Services Queensland, the Catholic Grandparents Association, the Marriage Resource Centre, and a range of other interested and interesting people. Our topic for this public lecture is one that does not receive a great deal of attention in either the public sphere or in academic discourse at the moment. However, and I know I'm probably preaching to the choir in making this point, the topic of the Catholic Sacrament of Marriage is one that is of vital importance to the future of our church and our society. Pope Francis wrote in Of Married Love as part of God's plan for humankind in his 2016 post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Amoris Laetitia. Francis wrote, marriage is a precious sign for when a man and a woman celebrate the sacrament of marriage, God is, as it were, mirrored in them. He impresses in them his own features and the indelible character of his love. Marriage is the icon of God's love for us. God is also communion. The three persons of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit live eternally in perfect unity. And this is precisely the mystery of marriage. God makes of the two spouses one single existence. Today, we have a wonderful opportunity to focus in on this very special sacrament of Christian service, the sacrament of Catholic matrimony. And to lead us in our considerations, it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our very special guest lecturer. Professor Julie Hanlon Rubio is the Shea Husserman Professor of Christian Social Ethics and Associate Dean of the Jesuit School of Theology of Santa Clara University in Berkeley, California, USA. Before joining JST, she taught for 19 years at St. Louis University. Her research focuses on Catholic social thought and family and questions of marriage, sex and gender. She is the author of six books, including the award-winning Family Ethics Practices for Christians and Hope for Common Ground. In 2019, Julie co-edited a collection of essays called Sex, Love and Marriage, Catholic Perspectives, which introduced new work in the field of family ethics, which she helped to define. She has a new book coming out in 2023 from Oxford University Press titled, Can You Be Catholic and Feminist? Which should be a fascinating read. Julie is a regular contributor to academic journals such as Theological Studies, Horizons, the Journal of the Society of Christian Ethics, and the Journal of Political Theology. She also writes frequently in popular outlets such as America Magazine, National Catholic Reporter, The Washington Post, and US Catholic. Today, we are delighted to hear her speak on the topic, Does the Catholic Sacrament of Marriage Have a Future? Please join me in warmly welcoming Professor Julie Hanlon Rubio. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, it's really my pleasure to, to be with you. I so wish I could be with you in person. Um, I've never been and hope to visit someday. Um, I'm conscious of the limits of what I, what I can do from here, um, but hope that, um, that we can find some, some overlap in our situations and our different theological perspectives so we can have a fruitful conversation and look forward to learning from all the wisdom that is gathered in the room. I, um, I've been at this profession for about 30 years, uh, a little more, and I've also been married for about 30 years, and I've been interested in marriage for, for this, this whole time. It seemed to me as a young graduate student that there wasn't, a, there wasn't enough attention in the world of theology to marriage and family, and that interested me. 
And so I started my work then and wrote my dissertation on uh, Catholic theology of marriage and Catholic social teaching. And I've been committed to, to thinking about marriage since that time. And so like you, uh, I am concerned about the declines in marriage that we're seeing in the US and Australia and across the world. Um, not because um, I think, I, th I don't think we're concerned because we wanna judge people who aren't marrying. Uh, we wanna say marriage is the only way, um, but because we're convinced of the value and the power of marriage. And we also know that marriage is difficult and uh, it's difficult to, to come to more so than ever perhaps, and also difficult to sustain. So how do we think about those things together? So today I'd like to do some work to first understand the situation, then talk about this vision of marriage, which I think is underappreciated, and then put that vision within the broader context of the Christian tradition which is, I think, broad enough and capacious enough to hold the diversity of households that identify as Catholics in our countries today. So I'd like to, to share my screen. So does the sacrament have a future? I'm gonna start with, with, um, with statistics from my own country. And I'll show you some parallels as well. So you can see from the 1890s, first, um, you, can, you can see that it's gone up and down over time. This is the marriage rate. So this is the number of marriages per year per thousand people. Um, but you can see that, yeah, it's not a straight line. You can see it goes down during the depression in our country. It goes up in the post-World War II era to a peak in the 50s and then varies, but then really settles into a pretty steady decline. We have some parallel graphs from Australia. Um, here you see both the number of marriages and the marriage rate portrayed. A piece of this for sure is that the median marriage age is going up. So if people aren't marrying until later, then the marriage rate is going to be lower, right? And your age, median age are, is, is about the same as ours from what I can tell, right? So people are spending less of their lives married. Mm -hmm. However, I think it's important to put this in context that when you look over the whole arc of people's lives, the vast majority will marry at least once, right? And so those numbers, those numbers are lower for um, today than they were in the 60s, even, right? And they are lowering, and people are trying to figure out if they can, if we continue along this path, will they be lower still? But but still, the vast majority marrying at least once. Yet the percentage of people who are married at any given time is a good deal lower. In the US, there's also a great deal of variation by race and ethnicity. So although there have been declines across the board, those declines are steeper and they're coming from a lower place to begin with, especially for African-Americans and to a limited extent also for Hispanic Americans. All right, we'll need to pay attention to that because when we ask people um, why they don't want to marry um, or, or if, they, if they want to marry and why they don't want to marry, um, the, the answers are pretty consistent across the board in terms of wanting to marry, but especially African-Americans and Latino Americans tell researchers that they often don't have the social and economic stability they would like to have, which they think is a prerequisite for marriage. We also have a parallel variation in marriage rates by education. So, um, so we really have two marriage cultures in the US where people who are um, college educated and beyond 
and with greater financial resources, marrying at much higher rates with those than those with less money and education. So the, the crude rate doesn't tell us the whole story. Still, even with all this variation, we need to take seriously the huge decline in Catholic marriages. So we have an oh, from we go from over 400,000 in 1970 to then fewer than 100,000 while the Catholic population increased significantly. Right? That's huge. Right? And this is what I'm sure um, you also are seeing in your churches. Right? How do we think about that? Surely the decline in marriage across the board is a part of it, but it's not the whole story. Something more is going on. When I look at the literature, uh, and it's not a robust literature, but I'd say that people, people float theories about why this is happening. Um, sorry, and, and the same thing uh, is happening uh, in your own um, situation, right? With the civil um, decline, the, the religious decline being more significant than the um, the religious than the civil decline. So why? Um, I, I've seen some speculate about the rules around Catholic weddings, um, the kinds of hoops you have to jump through. You can't get married outside. Um, you can't have certain songs or certain readings. So perhaps this keeps people out. But I, I'm not convinced that that's a it's a huge reason. Um, is there a concern perhaps among some about marriage equality? That is that they're married in the, in the they're marrying in a context in which same-sex couples can marry secularly, but not in the church. Would some feel uneasy about that, especially as their circle of friends and family includes same-sex couples, perhaps? Certainly the increase in cohabitation is a factor as this cohabitation has moved from becoming something that was relatively marginal to something that is almost um, a given, right? And no longer um, a taboo for sure, then it becomes a real alternative, not just as a way to see if one might marry, um, but as a possible way to be without the baggage of marriage. Here in the US, we've seen steep declines in baptisms as well. So certainly there are fewer uh, families who are raising their children in the context of the church uh, for whom marriage would seem, marriage in the church would seem just natural. Okay. Um, and more people existing along the margins of the church. We can't rule out social economic reasons. Right, the ones I alluded to earlier that keep people from being ready for marriage. Across the board in the US uh, groups uh, say that they should be um, set is the word, set before they're married, right? Meaning economically and socially set. And so if, they, if, if some can't get there, they worry that they shouldn't marry, right? And then there's this, this, this more nebulous concept of commitment phobia, or, or what Francis likes to call the cultural of the ephemeral. And I've got a quote here from World Youth Day where he used this concept, but he uses it in a lot of different places to say that there's something about us that suggests that maybe we, about our culture that suggests that long-term commitments, absolute commitments don't make as much sense. And I, I love the way he kind of reframes that here and says that actually marriage isn't the traditional choice, it's the revolutionary choice. And he calls youth to think about it in that way and to have the confidence to take this up. I think there's some merit in all of these um, explanations, but I'd like to suggest um, some other reasons that might be a part of it. What, what I'm going to call the unbelonging, feelings of unbelonging, I think are a part of the issue. People feeling like they're not perfect enough, Catholic enough, holy enough to approach this sacrament. And then really an, a less well-known than it should be view of marriage. Uh, I find that even though maybe Catholic views on marriage are the thing that people think they know about Catholicism, if they're Catholic or not. 
as as a matter of fact, the, the the depth of the vision is not well known. And I find this when I talk at parishes, and I find it when I talk um, with priests or men studying for the priesthood or lay and lay men and women studying to, for ecclesial ministry. People are surprised at what is there in those documents. So if some have called our Catholic social teaching the church's best keep best kept, kept secret, I would say that. Our teaching on marriage and family is also a secret in some ways. And so what I'd like to talk about is how, do we, how are we moving from unbelonging? How do we move people to, from feeling unbelonging to feeling welcome? How do we lift up this vision that is really worth striving, that is sacramental, but also I think crucially social? And how do we do that within the diversity of the body of Christ, which includes so many different kinds of families and households today. So part one, this unbelonging. When um, over the course of my career, when, when people invite me to speak at churches or other kind of Catholic communities, they assume that lots of people will show up because we're talking about marriage and family and people want to know about these things. Finally, the young people will come <laughs> to a talk, right? Um, but I'm usually uh, more skeptical, frankly, because I've seen the pattern. And in fact, more people will show up to a talk on Pope Francis or social justice than to talk on family. And I, I think um, I, I don't have I don't have good data on this, but my sense is that people feel inadequate. They feel like if they're going to go to a talk on marriage and family at a Catholic church, they might be feeling, they might be feeling less than, as we say here, less than, right? because they think of the holy family. They think of that perfect family at church in the front pew with the well-behaved kids, and that's not them. It's even broader than this. We have, we have um, pictures in our heads of what good families look like, people who can get everyone to wear the same clean white t-shirt and jeans at the, back, at the family reunion and take these pictures. These are the real families, the perfect families. And if, and if our families don't look like that, you can feel like maybe um, we're not good enough for marriage and the church. It was not always this way within the church that this idea of perfection, I think, uh, impeded people's views. This is a page from something called the Baltimore Catechism. So an early, a mid 20th century catechism that was widely used. And you can see that there's a real um, uh, disconnect uh, um, and a hierarchy between vowed life of holiness and marriage, which is okay um, if you can't measure up, right? <laughs> and the idea is here that marriage is, is something that you do if you wanna, wanna exercise your preferences, do whatever you want versus uh, spending the, the, way, the day in your life the way God would want. Um, I have to imagine that the authors of the catechism didn't spend much time in family life if they had this view, but that was certainly there. That's not where we are today. We do have a really high understanding of Catholic marriage and family um, as a call to holiness and also a call to a social mission in the world. And that I think is a really exciting vision that is not well known. It goes back at least to Vatican II with this beautiful phrase that family, family is, a, is a school for deeper humanity. To so John Paul II's work, he really, he really um, developed this theology, um, especially in his 1981 document, Familiaris Consortio, and it moves through Pope Francis and also through the work of contemporary theologians who are today now married and reflecting on their own experience of what marriage is. So I wanna call, I think we can call people to that vision of holiness and of a mission to the world, but first families need to feel like they belong and that this vision is worthwhile. I actually think that the problem of unbelonging was exactly what the Synod on the Family in 2014 and 15 was all about. My sense is that Francis knew at the beginning of his pontificate that he, if he wanted to bring the whole church 
along with him on this mission that we've been on since since the beginning of the pontificate, he had to help people feel like they belonged. And he knew that the place where people feel the most unbelonging is marriage and family. And so this is, in my view, why he, he used the instrument of the synod, first of all, not to talk about poverty or the environment, although those have been hugely important in his papacy, but to talk about marriage and family. And he communicated to people that the church was coming from a place of humility. Remember the first words we heard from Francis, right? He was asked, who are you, right? And he answered a sinner who was loved by God, who's looked, right, who was loved by God. And he asked for our prayers, right? That was one of the first things we knew about him, that, that, that stance of humility. We know that he has, he has been willing to talk about the church's own sins, its own flaws, and to call priests and bishops and himself to accountability, first of all, right? And that he has talked about the church as a field hospital that goes out to meet people where they are. That means listening to where people are and not just assuming that we have all the answers to give to them. So first, with the Synod, what, what they did was listen. They sent out those surveys. Hopefully some of you were a part of some of the surveys that were sent out all over the world, right? They were collected. They were sent to the Vatican. They were collated. They were drawn up and became part of the preparatory documents for the Synod. And if you read some of those preparatory documents, um, it was clear that the church was willing to hear what people said. When they listened, they heard people say, we don't understand these teachings, or a lot of people don't accept these teachings. We're not sure we can live these teachings out. We might disagree with some of these teachings. We, we want to make sure that everyone feels welcome here, regardless of what our teachings are. Those, all of those things are in the preparatory documents because the church dared to listen. Right? Then there was, there was an attempt in the synod documents. The, so the, the documents that came out after the bishops from around the world finished their conversations with each other was an attempt to try to communicate the essentials of marriage. And there's more of that that we'll hear about when I talk about Morris Letizia later. But, but I think it's important that Francis and others knew that what they were communicating about marriage and family was often not very attractive or it felt very judgmental. And so they had to back up and communicate the essentials. There's some beautiful phrases in those documents. Um, one about marriage, it, the final document says, in the liberty of the yes exchanged by the man and the woman for their whole lives, the love of God is made present and is experienced. That's really simple, right? In their yes, the love of God is, is experienced, made present. Um, it doesn't sound like a super complicated and theoretical sacramental theology, but that's what it is, right? God is present in their yes, not just in their yes in the, in the wedding ceremony, but in the yes of their lives. But because they were able to come down to where people were and, and use kind of plain language, they were able to communicate what was essential without putting judgment first. Right? In, this, in the words about, about parenting, there's a sense that parents communicate the faith. Yes, people know this but also that they share plans and fatigue, desires and preoccupation, that they take care of each other and they learn to forgive each other. There's a sense of the give and take and, and the imperfection of daily lives. About family as a place where we live with others despite our differences and we learn to belong despite our fragility. So there is in these documents a sense that we have to learn to narrate marriage and family better so that people can see themselves in our teachings. Third, in the sin on the family, Francis wanted to communicate 
mercy before judgment. It has never ceased to amaze me that when students come to my classes and I ask them, what do they know about what the church teaches? What they say is judgment. What they say is no. And, and I have to work to get them to see the invitation, right? The yeses, <laughs> the affirmation. And, and Francis and the Synod did that by offering mercy before judgment. There's a lot of talk in the Francis Pontificate, especially in the year of mercy, of this idea that mercy is not opposed to truth, but is a part of the church. Of the idea that we have to open the doors, open the doors literally, right, and figuratively so that, so that people find their way back. There's still a need for conversion and for challenge and all of that, but first people have to feel the merciful love of God. One of my favorite phrases from Pope Francis is, the, is this, seek God in every human life. Although the life of a person is a land full of thorns and weeds, as we know, uh, there's always a space in which a good seed can grow. We have to trust God. And what he's saying there, I think, is so such a profound realization, recognition of mercy, right? The ability to look at people and see that despite the thorns and the weeds, God's working there, right? God's there. Fourth, accompaniment. This is a word that, uh, that appeared only sporadically and, and briefly in Catholic teaching on marriage and family before Francis, but with Francis, it's everywhere, right? This is a key to the synod, the idea that the church is not there to just hand down truths, but is there to keep company with, to walk with people, not to try to solve every problem, to give all of black and white answers, no, but, but to, to listen, to walk with, to support in times of trouble. That's what the synod tried to communicate. And finally, disagree, but keep talking. This, I think, is really important. What we remember from the synod is the bishops did not agree, <laughs> right? Even though they, they were talking behind closed doors every day, at the end of the day, we would get the reports and we would know that there was tension, right? And Francis kept them all in the room. He made sure to communicate to the church, to the world, and to the bishops themselves that they were valued, even though they disagreed that the kind of debate they were having, he, has, he says this in his final speech um, to the Synod, the kind of debate they were having was hugely important to the church, that everyone had a place, that the arguments were part of the life of this church family. So if people feel an, a sense of unbelonging because of disagreement, Francis with the Synod said, no, the bishops who disagree, the bishops that hate me, <laughs> right? They're all here, I'm not kicking anyone out, right? Everyone is welcome here. And what we don't see is just as important. What we didn't see at the Synod was condemnations. We didn't see an outsiding of people. We didn't see a refusal to discuss hard issues because they were settled, right? We saw this consistent desire to make people feel like they belong. Once that happened, right, then we were in a position to talk about the vision. But I think it's clear, I, I just said that happened, but I would say that that was given to us as a model. And now as church, right, we are able to do our own work of dissipating sense, the sense of unbelonging, and then also offering this vision. Right. So intimacy, starting there. There is in Francis's own writing on the joy of love, right, so much about intimacy, right? So much about, um, about the daily life, about the emotions, the communication, the way of life that two spouses share. And Francis is able to share this because he first, before he even does that, 
says, admits that the church has sometimes not done a good job of talking about this. Before we start talking about intimacy and fidelity, he says, uh, he has that famous phrase that's been talked about a lot. We have been called to form consciences, not replace them. Because he knows that a lot of people are thinking, my conscience is not respected here. But once he, so once he kind of clears that out of the way and says, yeah, we've not always been good at this, but let me tell you what we can say, what we have to say about intimacy. And knowing that people think about intimacy in more romantic terms, he puts it in the context of fidelity and imperfection. So love is not perfect. Love does not have to be perfect for us to value it. It's in our finitude, it's in our brokenness that we love each other in marriage. I think he's saying to many who would think, I'm just not in love anymore, that maybe there is something here amid the imperfection. And that fidelity, rather than being a, a, a yoke or a duty, is precisely the thing that holds us, that enables us to grow, to stay present, to achieve the depth that we're looking for. So just as God does not abandon us despite our imperfection, despite our infidelity, this is what spouses are called to do. They're a sign. Here we have that sacramental language again, the sign and instrument of the closeness of God. This is wisdom worth sharing, but he's, he doesn't present it as something that is static. It just is, but rather he think, presents it as something that you have to work on, cultivate, grow into over time. It's not just that we stay but that we do the work, right? The intimacy that Francis talks about, go back for one minute. He has, he has a, um, there's a part in there where he says, you know, when you're, he has a lot in there about communication, which is part of the work. Uh, he says, don't be boring. Um, in one place, right? But I think what he's trying to get at is that this, you can't, can't simply let this happen, let it unfold. It ha there has to be agency here over the course of a lifetime. And particularly, this is interesting to me is, as here in the US where we're fine, divorce rates as, as in most places have leveled off or declined, except among older couples. And I wonder if there, there is a sense that there, there, there isn't um, a sense of why we need to keep doing that work, especially if the kids are gone out of the house. But Francis here is saying love, it goes on and needs to be cultivated, even when people are sick or elderly, um, when people feel unseen, when people are unattractive, he says a couple of times, right? This is not the story that the movies tell, but this is but this is still intimacy and this is still worth cultivating throughout the lifespan. But even after all that narration of the beauty of intimate love over time, of covenant, of the joy of being in relationship and the work of being in relationship, of the experience of belonging completely to another person, even after all of that. He knows that we cannot talk about all that without talking about the need to accompany those for whom marriage fails. If we don't do that, right, our, our witness is not going to be credible. And so here too, there is accompaniment, right? There is repeated, those who are divorced are not excommunicated, they shouldn't be treated as such. He thinks he has to repeat it and insist on it because he knows that people do feel this. The mercy applies to them. They are also welcome here. They may have wisdom to share about marriage. 
right? And it's the role of the church to accompany them. Both the couples who are experiencing difficulties, who have experienced brokenness, and the children who are, he notes here, not shying away from hard truths, who are the most vulnerable and who often suffer, right? We are here, he is saying, to support you, to walk with you, to accompany you. Accompaniment is a part of our vision of the sacrament. The church is not here simply to lay down rules, but to be a resource for couples in trouble, be a resource for those who are divorced, to have to welcome people with our ministries and make them feel like they truly do belong. Now, I mean, the, the part that got the most attention was the move he made to make it possible for people who are divorced and remarried to make their way back to the sacraments. But it's a broader thing. It's a much broader thing in the famous chapter eight of Amoris Laetitia. It's a much broader vision of making space for all those who don't have the perfect marriage. There's also a lot of acknowledgement within this vision of social forces that make marriage difficult. Now, this is often a part of previous um, Catholic teachings on marriage and family, but with Francis, it's a much larger part. He spends more time dwelling on the difficulties. So, and I have them here listed in a chart that has two sides. One is more sort of cultural ideas individualism, this ephemeralism again. Um, also this concept um, that we have here that is so, I think, problematic, although I understand why it's attractive, of the one, of there being one person who is there for me um, to marry and no one else is that one. Right. So these are problems. These are a romantic and individualistic way of, of viewing relationships that actually make us hard to commit to marriage, because even if we think we don't want to think that way, it's in the water, right? It's the air we breathe, it's there in the culture, and so of course we're absorbing it. But then he's also talking about these social forces like migration and poverty, racism, that make marriage harder. So for instance, when we think about um, incarceration here in the United States, we know the incarceration rates for African-American men are far higher than those for white men. Um, what that means, practically speaking, is that a lot of Black men are removed from their community. And even if they come back, it's much harder for them to get employment, right? So what that means, that, that's a big part of why the marriage rates for African-American women are so much lower. We have to take account of that social force the, and of the poverty that makes it harder for people to feel that they are set so that they can get married, of migration that makes it literally harder for people to stay in the same place because they feel obligated to go somewhere else in order to make a living. So if so, our vision has to include, our vision of marriage has to include attention to these social forces, especially because, and here Francis references Pope John Paul II's um, document on the rights of families, in Catholic teaching, society has a duty to support families. Families have rights before government, right? So government owes these things. We need to make sure then as a church that we are advocating for the kinds of things that will make marriage possible that will make family sustainable. With these things in place, then now we're in a position to call families to something else. And this is where I think this is the best kept secret part, right? That families are about more than their own good. If the social vision of marriage is romance, if when, I'm, when I watch a TV show about a romance, um, the way that, that, that people know that a, that a relationship is real is by the way he looks at her, by the way they look at each other, right? 
that's not exactly the Catholic vision. There's something much broader. It's not that intimacy is unimportant. We've just talked about how important it is, but there's more, right? So that the family, this, so this was already there in John Paul II. The family is by its nature and vocation open. It's not just about procreation and education, although those are essential. There's a social and political role that is part of the sacrament, right? It's a command, it's a duty, and it's also part of the grace that they receive. That's not the way we're used to thinking about sacrament. But this, John Paul II said, was a huge part of what it means to be a family. Francis brings his own earthy language to this social mission of the family that has always been a part of Catholic social teaching. He says family shouldn't be a refuge, not closed, but open. They should go forth and they can become a hub for integrating persons. What a gorgeous image of what a household should be. Here we have you know, an image of the family meal. Reflecting back on the Eucharistic table, gathering people, sharing food, right? But it's but it's not yeah. So it's but it's not just this small family, not just this nuclear family. They're integrating. They're using the gift and the strength that they have to call others into relationship. There's a, a reference to a poet. Um, a poem in Amoris Laetitia. That's one of the most beautiful passages. And it's interesting, you know, when I was look, I was looking for um, a picture to go along with it. And I, I Googled, you know, couple holding hands and, and Google said back to me and staring into each other's eyes. And I was like, no, 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 <laughs> this is not what I need, right? I want them to be looking out. And this is about as, as, uh, as good as I could do, right? Because we can't see their faces. Um, but this is this is what Mario ben Benedetti says in this poem quoted in Amoris Laetitia. I love you because your hands work for justice. You're my love, my companion, my all. We are side by side much more than two. So the Catholic image is not the two people staring into each other's eyes. It's not the way they look at each other. It's the way they look out into the world together using their strength to integrate, to go forth. That is not, right? That is not the dominant vision in their culture, but it is something that is challenging and deep, that will take a lot of work, right? That makes sense for a lifetime. Let me go back for one minute, right? So if families are about intimacy, fidelity, and this outward flowing vision, that is a lot, right? The vision here is not detailed. The details are often filled in these days by married theologians who talk about things like the open home, what it means to have an open home, who talk about practices of resistance that families can adopt, of simplicity, of service, of protest, all kinds of ways that families can embody this deep and outward facing vision. This is the marriage of a vision of sacramental marriage that is worth cultivating, worth working on, worth sharing. And yet, I think part of the genius of Francis is that he does not let us rest there. And we shouldn't, because we have to know that our tradition is, is more diverse than this. And so is our church. So if we look at family more broadly in the Christian tradition, we have to grapple with Jesus's hard sayings, they're often called, 
about family. Although there are beautiful words about marriage in the New Testament in which Jesus refers back to Genesis, and those are the ones that are usually read in the wedding liturgy, most of what Jesus has to say about marriage and family is far more difficult, challenging. Most of the wisdom that we find in the Gospels seems to decenter family. We find a seeming disconnect between staying with house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children, right? Staying with that and following Jesus. Rather, we see following Jesus means leaving behind and receiving something new. We find this really challenging saying in Luke that one has to even hate. And of course, Jesus doesn't mean what we might think that means by hate um, one's family in order to be a disciple. But we can't dismiss these sayings too easily. We can't just say, put God first. Um, there's something here that in saying after saying, it seems that Jesus wants to challenge the culture around him, wants to say, family can become an idol, right? Family values, right? But this can become an idol and this can be a problem. And I think about how this works out, practically speaking. If everything is about family, what do I have left to give to the others who are my brothers, my sisters, my mother, my father, my children, right? What do I have left to give? If family is all in all for me, it seems that the hard work of the social justice tradition is left to people who are single and celibate. But Jesus, that's not the vision of Jesus. So there's a challenge here that I think sometimes in the Christian tradition was applied just to people who were celibate, vowed, leading to that two-tiered idea of vocations that we saw earlier in the presentation, but is more appropriately identified as a challenge to all of us. How do we make sure that family is important, but not of ultimate importance? How do we make sure that we can hear Jesus's challenge to see that all who do the will of God are our sisters, our brothers, right? That the first family for all Christians is the church. That's a part of our tradition. Also in the gospel, we see many instances of single people as models for us. Actually, if you look for visions in the gospels of a family, say a, a mother and a father and children gathered around a table, it's hard to find. <laughs> it, it really hardly exists, but what we do have over and over is family, right? But we often have a single father or mother showing the love of God. We think about the father and the story of the prodigal son. Where is the mother? She never appears. Where is Jairus's wife, right? What about the widow, right? Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, right? There's no marriage there. And also among the early Christians, we know that there was a combination. There were married couples but also who, who started the churches in their home, but also many singles who went out and spread the gospel. And so here in the very gospels, we know that marriage and family is not the only way that people live out their Christian vocation. Rather, the primary vocation is discipleship.
in Amoris Laetitia, there's this phrase that was also there in the, in the Synod. Every family, despite its weaknesses, can become a light in the darkness of the world. And I think that if we as Catholics are going to have a credible and compassionate and an attractive vision of the sacrament of marriage, we have to also own that families, even those that aren't anchored by the sacrament of marriage, as more and more of our families likely will be, are also sites of grace, are also sites of light. We don't want to create a complete two-tiered um, vision of holiness in the church today with marriage on top and everyone else lesser, less than, right? So to sum up, I think the Catholic vision of sacramental marriage can have a future. But we have to take seriously where we are. The numbers that we've looked at today are sobering. They have to give us pause. It can't simply mean doing what we've always done. Certainly, we know that people need to feel like they belong if they're going to take up a challenge. And it's clear that even today, they're post Vatican II, right? Post all these things, right? Even today, many people still feel like there is not a place for them in the Catholic Church, that they are not good enough for the sacraments that we have. So we have to, to follow the lead of the synod in figuring out how to move more people from unbelonging to a, to, a, to a sense of welcome and belonging through that accompaniment, through walking with them. Second, we have to put out there something that is distinct from what is everywhere else, right? Yes, there is loving marriage and loving cohabitation and loving partnership and loving friendship and all other kinds, there are all other kinds of visions that are out there. And there, there are resonances with what we have in the church, but the church has something in particular to offer. Sometimes I think we hesitate to offer it. Right? To say that marriage is sacramental is to say that it's caught up somehow in the life of God, to say that somehow, even given our finitude and imperfection, people in married couples, as well as couples and their children and children to their parents, right? That, that, that within the sacrament, grace is made present. Right? And, and that it is not simply internal, that rather it's a sign of God's love, not just for the people within, but for the church, for the world. This is a vision that does not begin and end with the wedding. It's not just a sacrament because it's a wedding. It, it's a sacrament that does not begin and end with raising children. It's a sacrament that can have a mission, a purpose, right? And growing depth over a lifetime. But this vision has to be put within the diversity of the body of Christ. It seems likely that fewer Catholics will be married, just like fewer people in our countries as a whole will be married. More of that we will, when we address everyone, we will address people, uh, more people who are single than not. We have to talk within that, the rea that reality because that is our reality right now. And we can do that with our tradition because marriage is a place, a place 
a voca one vocation, one way of living out the primary Christian vocation of discipleship, but not the only way. There's room here for, for those who have experienced divorce, for those who are single and never married, for the widow, for all of these people who don't fit that perfect model. Sometimes when we talk about the sacrament of marriage, at least in the States, the image is that of the family dinner. And I would like to say that although I'm a big fan of the family dinner, and in fact, most Sunday nights in my family still, um, we gather, uh, we, my husband and I now are alone, um, and we, but our three sons usually join us via some kind of video um, to sit at the table and to have that family dinner. And it is a graced part of our lives. I'm a big fan of the family meal, but I think our vision as Catholics is broader. It's a, it's, it's a table, right? It's a table of singles and married people and widows, right? It's a table where everyone belongs. And that's the vision within which we can talk about the Catholic sac sacrament of marriage. It's this inclusive table of sinners and seekers and disciples gathered around Jesus, listening, being formed by disciples, by the master who walks in the ways of love and justice so that they can go out, so that we can go out and do likewise. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for what was a really marvellous lecture there. Um, you've given us a very rich and nuanced analysis of, of current issues surrounding marriage in our cultures today. And I think you have suitably complexified what has been previously perhaps an oversimplified uh, po position on marriage um, in a lot of our teaching uh, or emphasis that we hear, especially from um, the pulpit many times. I think your emphasis on drawing forth Francis's thinking on accom the accompanying role of the church is absolutely vital and that that is present right from the start um, of the sacrament prior to prior to people becoming married during the ritual itself and all the way through marriages. It's a, a marvelous image to keep very much at the forefront of our thinking as we, we pursue new visions here. Um, I know you've raised many thoughts amongst the group and I'd like to ask one of our members to offer a formal response to your lecture before we then open up to a broader conversation for input from the rest of the group. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr Daniel McGrath from the Archdiocese of Brisbane to offer a response to Julie's lecture. With a significant background in education and educational administration, Dan is a facilitator of pre-marriage education for Centre Care in Brisbane. Uh, in 2015, Dan completed an excellent master's thesis at ACU on marriage as sacrament and covenant, a new model of pre-marriage education based on the right of marriage. And he has just completed an excellent doctoral thesis on marriage as creative union, a liturgical theology drawn from the order of celebrating matrimony. So may I introduce and ask you to welcome Dr. Daniel McGrath. Well, uh, yes. thank you for that uh, very generous introduction, Claire. And thank you, Professor Hanlon Rubio, for your uh, challenging, um, authentic, and I think um, really helpful presentation on Catholic marriage today. I think you got it ex uh, exactly right that um, Catholic marriage can and should have a future, but we can't keep doing as we have. So thank you very much. Um, you covered adequately, I think, the Australian statistics, which in many ways parallel what's happening in your country. You know, um, just a couple of things that strike me. Um, in the 20 years to 2016, the total number of marriages in Australia increased by 12%. Yet in that same period, Catholic marriages declined by 55%. Um, in recent years, 
the rate at which Catholic marriage is declining is faster than the rate at which other religious rights are declining. So we have a Catholic problem here, and you've addressed that well. Um, and I, I was impressed with your focus upon uh, intimacy. Um, there's a secular summary of the benefits of marriage, which puts intimacy right up front. And it goes like this, not everybody wants to be married, but for those who do, marriage brings intimacy, companionship, fulfillment, and for many, the joys of children and grandchildren. Married people live longer, are healthier, and are more satisfied with their lives, especially married men. You know, I think there is a, a sting in the tail there. Why should we as married men be more satisfied with our lives than married women? It's another reminder that we have work to do in this area of uh, equality within marriage. And, and the other thing that's related to that is that, you know, there, there are those fulsome benefits of marriage. Um, and there is evidence from here, from the US and the UK, that high income individuals, and this came out in one of your slides, high income individuals understand the benefits of marriage. They continue to marry, to stay married, and to enjoy those benefits of marriage, while the poor are largely excluded. So we have work to do in that social justice area as well. Most people express the desire to marry, but some are prevented by their social, economic, educational situation. And I think the promising thing there is that education can lift people uh, out of poverty and into the possibility of marrying. The other thing that struck me in your social responsibilities associated with marriage. It's one of those hidden treasures, as you said, that the current catechism says, you know, this marital love which God blesses is intended to be fruitful and to be realized in the common work of watching over creation. And I think uh, Amoris Letitia missed an opportunity. You know, it came out a year after Laudato Si. The reports from the synods made the connection that as married people, we have to turn outward to the whole of creation. We have this responsibility to watch over creation. In the reports from the synod, not enough is made from it uh, in Amoris Letitia. Um, so, The, the, the other thing that you rightly commented upon, I think, was uh, Amoris Letitia showed a development in methodology as well as contact. It's replete with the voices of married people. Um, and that was a really positive development. There's been a similar positive development here in Australia. Uh, within Australia, even before the COVID epidemic, we had uh, an epidemic of domestic violence. The figures in our country are atrocious, that one woman is killed every nine days by a current or previous partner. And that, that must be a deterrent to marriage, to relationships. Um, and there's been long-term criticism that our church hasn't addressed this serious problem. Well, this year, the Australian Catholic Bishops Conference, in its social justice statement, did address that topic. And it's a very positive statement. It, it's replete again with the voices, and it's of mainly women who are the victims of domestic violence. But it's informed by sociological and psychological research. But, and it accepts that inequality between women and men is one of the central drivers of domestic violence. Right. 
and that the incidence of domestic violence and abuse within Christian congregations is similar to that within the general population, but it gets worse. The statement notes that it's alarming to learn that abused Christian women are more likely to remain in or to return to unsafe relationships, citing religious beliefs to support such decisions. Uh, and it comes up with some possibility of us all reflecting about the way we speak about marriage, right? We can take greater care in the language that we use. We can speak more clearly about the sinfulness of domestic violence. We can debunk the misuse of faith sources to justify violent or abusive behavior or to coerce women in marriages marked by these behaviors to stay in unsafe situations. So a very promising document uh, in the methodology of Amoris Letitia. It's one of those bright spots and um, you focused on Amoris Letitia as another one. So um, the figures are damning with regard to the decline of Catholic marriage. Um, Catholic marriage has all of the benefits of marriage in general, plus more. You know, we would say intimacy is a grace. It's one of the ways we grow in married relationships. Um, and you've given us a whole lot of uh, practical ways, I think, that we can make sure that we don't continue to do what we have been doing, that we can have a brighter future for Catholic marriage. Thank you again. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, Julie, would you like to offer any response to Dan before we open up the floor to some questions? I just wanted to offer thanks and and and, uh, and uh, you were absolutely right to bring in domestic violence as, as key. I, I think it's there in Amoris Letizia. It, it needs to be more present in our Catholic marriage ministries um, and our and, and it needs to be in our minds as we're thinking about how we talk about marriage and family. So thanks, but I'd love to hear more questions. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. We um, uh, I invite you to write your questions in the chat or if you'd like to raise your virtual hand, we'll, we'll get to you um, as well with that. We've got a couple here already. Um, Elizabeth has one for us uh, in terms of asking about how the church um, uh, deals with, uh, well, she says that um, as soon as, as people know that I've become Catholic, I get asked about divorce, remarriage, gay and lesbian marriages, etc. cetera. Um, and it's a, div it's a curly question. And how, how does the church um, consider LGBT, uh, et cetera, marriages? Yeah, these, I, I think you're right, that these are the things that are absolutely on people's minds, and it makes it um, more challenging to, to offer this witness in society. Um, I mean, I think that what we can say about divorce and remarriage now is that, that it's because we value committed intimacy over a lifetime so much that we worry about divorce. Um, but divorce is, is secular divorce at any rate, is allowable, especially in situations in which um, living together is no longer possible. So separation of bed and board, as it has been called historically, right, is, is allowed. And there is um, now a path back to remarriage through annulment, which um, Francis has tried to encourage the, the church to, um, to make easier for people. So um, we can say that. I, I think on um, LGBTQ marriage, we have um, smaller steps toward, um, especially through the work of um, Father James Martin, a Jesuit from the United States, who is advocating for taking the experiences of LGBTQ Catholics seriously, of, um, of listening to them, of calling them by name and recognizing the goodness that is present in their relationships. There was actually some very promising language in the synod during the synod midway through 
that didn't make it to the final document, um, which means I don't think the Catholic world is quite there yet, but I think at least the posture of listening um, gives us some hope for the future. Thank you, Julie. We have another question also from Elizabeth. She's got lots of questions today, which is great. Um, she's asking how will the church help those victims of domestic violence despite the sacrament of marriage, um, uh, which can leave these victims further estranged from their faith in society? I, I think that the problems come in when you, when sometimes when victims of domestic violence approach ministers in the church and are told that their obligation is to stay. We need to make sure that our uh, both lay and clergy ministers who are working with families understand the dangers, understand um, what Dan rightly referred to, a, a, a tendency of of Catholic women, Christian women more broadly, to stay even when they're taking abuse. Um, this isn't what we want for anyone. There are times to leave um, for your safety and the safety of your children. We need to make sure that that message is present um, in church bulletins and in the counseling, right? So that so that people, both the, the counselors and um, women who are the primary victims themselves understand this. And then, um, you know, I think Dan also rightly, I, I'm, I'm glad to see that the Australian bishops referenced inequality as part of the ground that um, allows for and enables violence. And as we're thinking about what does it take to disable violence, we need to think about how we de-disrupt um, cultures and structures that enable violence. And so for us, that means figuring out how to say more about the equal dignity and the equality, equal rights of men and women with respect to our, each other. Earlier Catholic teaching was problematic on this count, and we need to, we need to say that. Um, but we, but it's changed. Um, and what we have now is, um, is equal partnership and that needs to be positively promoted. Um, and we need to understand that, that women are still getting messages from the culture that that is not the case, that they should take this upon themselves for the sake of their families. And we need to give them a different message. Wonderful, thanks, Julie. Anybody else with questions, feel free to raise your virtual hand or pop them into the chat. We've got a lot of folk who work in, in marriage and family uh, services within the church amongst us. So have some of you got some, some comments or questions? Damien has a question. Is part of our problem or part of the issue thinking about marriage or challenges of marriage today is the realisation it's a sacrament of church and our very understanding of church is being challenged and you know shifting and so forth but it's in the past we've filled marriage as a sanction for sexual activity which is you know perhaps a very negative way of putting it rather than the positive what idea of the great school of divinization i think perhaps francis a shift from mercy before judgment sort of like um hits the nail on the head here <laughs> yeah yeah no i think that's really helpful that that as a the, the link with the church itself has become problematic, um, especially in light of the clergy sexual abuse crisis. Um, this is also something that's a subject of my of my research. Um, so, how does one then? It, it does it make sense to go to the church for this um, permission um, at, in that sort of model? Um, only if one understands the church as also uh, on the way, right, as a pilgrim church that is also broken um, in various ways. We have to understand ourselves that way and then approach um, in, a, in the spirit of accompaniment, right, rather than coming from above and walk with people into this this new challenge but yeah I think um, yeah I mean in some ways it's an opportunity it seems to me 
there just aren't going to be as many people who are going to get married in the church because they think they need the church's position or even to make their grandmother or grandfather happy um, or for respectability. And so those who do choose it may choose it with, with more intentionality and more because they, more for a positive reason. I want this. I want to be called to this. And I think that's what, what we can hope for. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Damien, for your question and Julie for your wonderful answer there as well. Other questions? I can't see your name, but you've got a number there, 873763. Maybe you could tell yeah, us your I'm name. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, it's Ron Parola. Oh, wonderful, Ron. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Uh, you, you've referred, uh, thanks for your talk, it was terrific. Uh, and, uh, but uh, you're talking about the synods and the second point was communicate the essentials. Now, one of the essentials, you think the fullest expression of the sacrament of matrimony, you think that'd be an essential and the fullest expression is in sexual intimacy. Uh, but you rarely hear that. We're, we're actually much more concerned in the church with sex outside marriage than we are with sex inside marriage. And, uh, and yet society is obsessed with sex. They're talking about it all the time. So uh, we have a glorious message about sex and, uh, and uh, it's something uh, that's fantastic and we don't promote it very much. I think that needs to be highlighted a bit. Uh, it's, it's not that sex is perfect. Of course it's not. In, our, in every relationship, uh, everything we do is is we stuff it up basically but it's it is glorious and it's something that we need to talk about more i i would think so i just wanted to raise that point i mean we've talked about intimacy so far but we haven't talked about sexual intimacy thank you very yeah, much. i think it's a great point and and there is some of that language i left out some parts of my talk that talked about that um there there is a recalling of the of the language of the song of songs and and a sense that sex too is is part of the joy of love and also part of part of what we need to keep working on over time and so so that i mean if, if the culture is sex positive we we need to make sure that the church comes across as sex positive in our own way right it's not exactly the same thing but i think it's much deeper i actually think that there is an opportunity even in light of um the Me Too movement, actually, to talk more about it. Be, um, what I found, I found this as a teacher, there was an opening, because part of what we know from the Me Too movement is that sexual harm can, can be so disastrous because it can reach so deeply into us. And the flip side of that is that sexual goodness, sexual love and intimacy can also reach to that core. And so if we can help people think about what we're offering is actually this very depth and love that is missing and destroyed and betrayed in sexual violence, then I, I think there's an opening to talk about sex with much greater depth than um than than most places are no than most people are doing thank you wonderful forgive me if i mispronounce your name hashaya or hashia would you like to ask your question thank you um it's it's hasha um thank hasha. you so much for your for your talk um i i I came in a little bit late, um, so I apologize if there's there's things that have been crossed over. But um, I work um, in the Archdiocese of Sydney in marriage support, um, and I was um, I loved what you were saying about um, marriage as being this open home, um, and the idea of hospitality and um, and the the, the table. Um, it's a beautiful beautiful image, and I think um, in in my experience, um, I. It, I think a lot of couples can um, sort of feel like their their marriage is is not perfect, and so they don't they don't um, there's this sort of um, holding back or hesitation around that welcome. Is there in your research? Is there any way um, 
sort of enablers to build up that confidence to allow married couples to serve outside their their families in in like parishes and to not be afraid um you know of of inviting people um in um and to ground it in knowing that their marriage is a gift um if you could comment on that um that would be greatly appreciated thank you that's great thank you for that question I mean, as a theologian, I have to say that my expertise is more in the level of here's here's where we we ought to go um, and 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 less in the how. Um, and in many ways, I think I mean I learn a lot from reading from people like you who are working you know in the trenches, so to speak, who know more about the how. Um, but I do I do think it's helpful to to say that you know the that. The, we we talk we talk about sacraments and um, and vocation in the context of who we are as human beings, which is which is always graced and sinful, um, as the churches do. We are always talking about imperfection. We're great at talking about sin, right? <laughs> so we should be able to help people understand that it's a simple, imperfect people that we do everything. Um, and I wonder though if if um, it has occurred to me just. What if our, can, can we do things about our imagery? Um, the imagery that we use when we, when we advertise things about marriage and family or in the people that we choose to talk about that. Um, can we hear from, um, from people whose families don't look like, you know, that family with all the white t-shirts and jeans, you know? Can we hear from someone else um, from the unexpected places about marriage. I think that would, if we can model, um, show, to show that these two are models of sacramental marriage or of grace in the family, then I think people get the message that they too are welcome. Thank you, Julie. We've got a couple of questions in the chat, which I'll get to, and then we'll get back to our people with hand raise. Um, so Kathy has a lovely question here. Do we need to look at the marriage rights more carefully? At times, the language does not appear to promote the equality of the partners, is legalistic in tone, for example, using the word consent, and the baptismal and social justice elements are not so prominent. Yeah, it's a great question. I have um, I have some work on the right of marriage. Uh, it's actually where I began my research um, because I was engaged when I began writing about this, and I um, was actually given some really helpful materials from my own pastor at the time. So I think that there, first of all, that there is a lot of good language in the right that we perhaps don't um, emphasize enough. And it's certainly better than what was there before. Um, there are also choices within the right. Uh, and so one of the things that, um, so like when I have um, Jesuit scholastics in my classes on marriage and family ethics, they sometimes will create um, the template for the right that they will use with certain prayers chosen over others, precisely because there's more language of equality Right, or more of what they're looking for there. And then they have, one of them did a great um, annotated um, uh, version of the right where he linked to current theology, which does emphasize those themes um, with notes to himself to emphasize these, th these themes as a presider and in his homily, and that he shares this with his Jesuit brothers. I think that's a part of it. Um, so what do we emphasize? And then even use another Jesuit scholastic of mine um, did something similar using the right for a teaching tool in marriage uh, preparation. And again, using the right in conversation with contemporary theology to work with engaged couples to emphasize um, these important themes. Right. So, so yes, there are some problems. We can do something about it by our choices and by what we emphasize and what we say more about when we have the opportunity to. It's really interesting, Julie, with Dan's study here, you know, recognizing uh, and analyzing the, the 2016 writers that came out um, in Australia. It took us a while to get that translation through. But the first of the options for the entrance of the couple is that they come in together. 
the uh, the man and the woman walk down the aisle together. That's the first first of the options, which is an interesting choice. And the the photograph that we use to promote your public lecture actually has a young couple that were my students, um, or one of them was my student, and they decided to do exactly that um, because they wanted to emphasise the equality between each other. Um, and interestingly, they also had um, a best woman and a best man who were the bride had a best man and the 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 groom had a best woman <laughs> so they were they were breaking all sorts of boundaries and it was absolutely wonderful for them <laughs> and everyone to see no and we and we did my husband and i did the same 30 years ago um walked down the aisle together um and our both of our parents walked down together um first so we included family um, but then, yeah, we proceeded together. I think I think that's a great way to model it. And also, you know, there are so many ways in which the right that we have is actually more progressive yeah. than what's out there in the culture, less gendered. Um, and we don't even realize it. And we just sort of give in to cultural models instead of saying, look at here, look at this. Yeah, of course, you can have a best woman. This is about somebody standing up for you. Exactly right. And and the, the uh, um the marriage blessing, the nuptial blessing, there are various options there and they do not all emphasize only the woman. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, you've actually got to just go through the ride and all of the different options and actually, as you say, Julie, see how radical it in fact is. Um, Dominic's been patiently waiting with his hand up. Dominic, would you like to ask your question, please? Thank you, Claire. Dominic's been doing his his other work on the side, which is why my head keeps going like that. Um, thank you very, very much for your lecture. A very interesting um, set of points raised and given to us, which I'm really grateful for. Uh, thank you also for raising the uh, commentary around James Martin and the wonderful work he's doing. Um, it brings forward a very interesting idea that when we are talking about marriage, I'll go out on a real limb here and suggest that most of us in our parishes would not have a clue which of our parishioners are turning up who have been in committed, long-term, stable, loving, same-sex relationship, for want of a better word, marriages. Um, I'm thinking of my own parish where I have uh, two couples who I would have a delight in being able to stand up and point out have both got over 35 years each group when we you know when I'm talking about marriage. Um, but there's there's a huge amount of constraints around that. Um, I've now gone through two different religious orders and two sets of parish priests, uh, diocesan, who are very familiar with myself and my partner and our relationship, which has gone, which is knocking just shy of 40 years at the moment. Um, it's interesting also to note, but, you know, and, and that can't be, you know, that, that's never been acknowledged or even talked about in the parish setting. Um, it's interesting also to note that in the New South Wales Studies of Religion syllabus, marriage is one of the practices that can be studied as part of the HSC course. And it's my experience of seeing teachers do it is that it's done from a particularly almost me mechanistic model of here are two people, this is why they get married, churn through a machine, come out of the side, oh, marriage. Um, and we really have never done anything successful that I've seen that talks about um, promoting marriage within our schools as one of the topics that can be studied for HSC. Mm. That's higher school certificate, the year 12. Yeah, letter, sorry. Julie. Yeah, <laughs> the end of high school. Dominic, we'll let Julie respond if that's okay. Yeah, fair, absolutely. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I think that we need to find ways to recognize um, the partnerships, um, the marriages that are present within our congregations. I, I think Pope Francis has done that on a personal level. 
I think that we have the theology that can allow us to do that. Um, at my own parish, actually, last week, uh, I saw for the first time um, the music minister recognized the 40-year um, the commitment of the men who were lecturing that day. And um, I'd never seen that before, um, but everyone cheered. Um, so I think, uh, you know, we're, we obviously um, are not at a place where, um, where we can talk about these things as, as equal um, in, in magisterial teaching, but is there room? Um, is there room to recognize grace um, and, uh, and virtue? Um, certainly, and we need to follow James Martin's need, lead, I think, in that way, and just, just opening the door um, a little bit more. Professor Ruby, I would also point out that um, your experience would mirror my experience with the Most Holy Redeemer in San Francisco, where I've seen exactly the same thing occur. Thanks, Dominic. Um, Julie, if you'll indulge us one more one more question from a participant, if that's okay. Um, Alessio, do you have a, a, a quick question you can pop, pop through? Sorry, can you hear me? Claire? Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep. Um, I know you were talking about preparation before, and um, I, you may have said this, but I had to go out briefly. Um, I'm just wondering whether we might need to look at um, our seminary formation in light of the clergy um, who do or don't do marriage preparation. I mean, I know some clergy do it thoroughly. Um, there are others who just want to see the booklet and marry the couple. Um, and we were mentioning before about um, clergy and others saying, well, you have to stay for the sake of it, even if it's a domestic violence um, situation, which I certainly think people shouldn't stay. I think they should leave. So I'm just wondering whether in all of this, um, the seminary formation needs to be something that needs to be addressed or looked at in light of marriage and marriage preparation. And thank you for the good talk as well, by the way. Thank you. Yes, I think it's a great question. Uh, unfortunately, most of what is taught in seminaries is canon law, <laughs> um, which of course is important, um, but, um, but not sufficient. And I'm and I'm amazed even say um, in the States when I've lect had the opportunity to lecture to priests, they, even those who love John Paul II know his theology of the body, but not his theology of marriage um, and not his theology of family, let alone Francis. So I think there's a lot of room to, um, to help um, those in seminary understand the fullness of Catholic teaching and also then um, invite couples to some of, to that fullness without um, it, with, without getting trapped in some things that they think they have to say that they don't. Um, certainly part of our contemporary teaching is, um, is the condemnation of domestic violence that has to be said, that has to be addressed. Uh, so, so yeah, I would hope for much more robust theological, um, teaching on marriage and family, especially by married people, married theologians in seminaries, as well as contact with those in the fields of psychology and counseling that they can learn from them. They can have a lot of power. We need to make sure that they are equipped to use it well. Wise words indeed, Julie. Thank you so much. Um, I um, Unfortunately, we don't have any more time to take any more questions. I do apologize for those whose questions did not get engaged. Um, but we thank you very much for offering them. And thank you to everybody for your wonderful conversation and your attendance here today. I would particularly like to thank our very special guest lecturer, Professor Julie Hanlon Rubio, and our local, local respondent, Dan McGrath, Dr. Dan McGrath, for their excellent contributions. Thank you also to Marianne Hemsley, our Centre Administrative Officer extraordinaire for her wonderful organisational work. Um, thank you so much to everybody. We wish you all the very best and, and we hope to see you again for another public lecture in the future. May I say thank you very much and farewell for now. Thank you.